Good evening and welcome to Current Issues. I'm your host, Hisham Tilawi. Welcome to the program, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, we are going to have an evangelical leader who sent a letter to President George Bush, signed by 34 evangelical leaders, telling George Bush that don't believe that all evangelicals in the United States support Israel blindly or do not criticize Israel or do not believe in the two-state solutions as John Hagee would have you believe that all evangelicals don't want Israel to have peace with the Palestinians don't want Israel to negotiate peace with the Palestinians and don't want Israel to give up not an inch of the West Bank to the Palestinians. Because John Hagee talks for all 30 million evangelicals in the country. But it turned out to be, ladies and gentlemen, that John Hagee does not speak for all evangelicals in the country. There are other evangelical leaders out there who know the Bible, study the Bible, and they don't believe in what John Hagee believes in. I'm talking about Dr. Ronald Sider, who sent a letter along with 33 other leaders to the president telling him exactly that. That they believe that the United States should use every effort and use its influence to help the Palestinians and the Israelis negotiate peace. We will be speaking about uh, what exactly this letter is all about and what it contains and why are they believing different from what John Hagee does even though they both and all of these people refer to themselves as evangelicals. But before we go there, um, most of you have heard about Pat Tellman and now we have a lot of uh, people in the army coming under criticism, some of them being demoted, even a lieutenant general being, uh, a general being uh, demoted. Now we told you about Pat Tellman over a year ago, and we told you there was a problem with what the media and the army had put out. We told you that his story was all nothing but fabrication, that he was not killed in combat, and his surgeon said that there were, there were three bullets in his head from close range and those bullets came from an American gun. We told you that back then. Now the media is telling it to you. We told you so. We just wanted to say that because we told you about Jessica Lynch when it, took, when it happened that what you saw on your uh, TV screens was nothing but a Hollywood produced scenario of what did not take place with Jessica Lynch. We told you about Tom DeLay a year and a half before the media even mentioned his name or his problems. We told you about Jack Abramoff and we told you about a lot of people that the news media will it'll take them about a year before they will bring it on mainstream news. 
but um, that's what happened with Pat Tellman. It's a tragedy, and it's a tragedy that his family had to endure before the truth came out. And I don't know if the truth will ever come out of exactly what happened. Like I uh, mentioned in my opening, ladies and gentlemen, um, I was under the wrong assumption that all evangelicals hold the same view, and that view is very much of what John Hagee's view is, and it turned out to be there are a lot of evangelicals out there, hundreds of thousands of them, if not millions, they don't believe in what John Hagee believe in. Now, what John Hagee believes that at the end time, Israel will be saved, and Israel will be the Jews will convert to Christianity and Jesus will sit at the throne of David and as John Hagee said that this might happen in his lifetime but that means Armageddon had to take place a lot of people have to die 144,000 Jews will be saved those who will be converted to Christianity and the rest of them have to die now of course as you remember, and we spoke about this on this uh, program many times, that John Hagee was the keynote speaker at the APAC conference. And 5,000 of those who attended gave him standing ovations many times. I don't understand that. A man who basically wants to destroy Israel, he wants to go after Armageddon, he wants to help God in ending this world by ending Israel and destroying Israel. Well, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we are, uh, we are joined by uh, Dr. Ronald Sider. Dr. Sider is a man with a distinguished career as a writer, lecturer, and a Christian thinker. He has written scores of powerful books and articles on the, pr uh, on the pressing topics which face our world. Peace and War, Riches and Poverty, Prejudice and Equality. Dr. Sider received a PhD in History from Yale University. Following several years of teaching at Messiah College, he joined the faculty of Eastern Baptist Theological Seminary, where today he is Professor of Theology and Culture. Since 1973, uh, Dr. Sider has been an important part of the organization called the Evangelicals for Social Action, where he is now serves as its uh, uh, president. Uh, Dr. Sider, welcome to the program, sir. Thank you. Glad to be on. Um, I uh, came across the letter that was uh, published in the uh, New York Times, and uh, it's what took you guys so long? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, many of us have been saying these kinds of things for uh, quite a while, but um, we felt that it was an important time to uh, say it again and to do it in the way that we did. And uh, uh, so we wrote the letter to President Bush and uh, sent it to him last Friday, and uh, the New York Times story uh, had an exclusive on Sunday, and uh, now it's uh, going on in lots of places. Now... I thought, and I was under the wrong assumption, that evangelicals are uh, uh, basically of the same thought and the same thinking when it comes to uh, theological uh, understanding. And uh, I mean, I'm, 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 I follow John Hagee very much, uh, you know, wanting to know what he thinks. And what he thinks is Armageddon, which he is pursuing. Uh, very well, I might add, uh, uh, which calls for basically the destruction of Israel, and he wants to save about 144,000 Jews. Is that your understanding too, Dr. Sider? No, certainly not. There, there certainly are differences in the evangelical world. Uh, you know, the evangelical community makes up a quarter of all the voters uh, in the United States. It's a huge community. There are a variety of theological views and, um, and other views. But the center of what evangelicals believe is that um, Jesus, the Jewish carpenter, was God in flesh, that he died uh, so that anyone who trusted in him could be forgiven of their sins, 
he rose on the third day and invites anyone who believes in him to um, walk with him in life and live the way he uh, taught us to live and to live with him forever. And, you know, that central um, set of beliefs um, uh, and the, the belief that uh, the Bible is God's uh, special word to us uh, with special authority, that's common to all evangelicals. But there are differences on some, you know, very narrow, specific things. And one of the substantial examples of that sort is precisely all thinking about the end times. There are a significant number, they're probably minority, but a significant number of evangelicals who think that you can read certain parts of uh, the Bible, especially the book of Daniel and the book of Ezekiel and some parts and the book of Revelation, and that they're talking about the specific historical events, you know, that are happening now in the present. And the majority of evangelicals think that's just a wrong way to interpret the Bible. That it doesn't intend to give us that kind of detailed historical uh, information about the end times. We all do believe, as evangelicals, that at some time in the future, Jesus Christ uh, uh, will return, and uh, history as we experience it will come uh, to an end. But um, uh, it's, it's just a, a much narrower group that thinks they can get the details of when Christ is going to return and exactly what's going to happen. Uh, now, what, think that's wrong. what do you think John Hagee basing his uh, opinion on when he says it's going to happen in his lifetime? Well, uh, you know, uh, he tries to find specific uh, things in Ezekiel and Daniel and Revelation and he gives them a particular interpretation. Uh, part of the tragedy is that there have been Christians who have thought that uh, you know, the uh, return of Christ and the end times is going to happen in their lifetime. Uh, and they also thought that they knew who the Antichrist was going to be, who came right at the end. In the uh, 30s, um, when uh, Hitler was strong, uh, Hitler was going to be the Antichrist. And in the 40s, uh, with Stalin, uh, Stalin was going to be the Antichrist. And then it was uh, Gorbachev or uh, this or, or that person. And um, mainstream... Uh, uh, evangelicals think that's a silly, wrong-headed way to interpret the scriptures. And if you just go back and look at the way that uh, you know one person after another has been wrongly identified as the Antichrist is going to end history, uh, you can see how silly it is. Okay. Now, in, in your letter to uh, President Bush, in the uh, second paragraph, you said, we also write to correct a serious misperception among some people, including some U.S. policy makers, that all American evangelicals are opposed to a two-state solution and the creation of a new Palestinian state. Um, do you think it's a misperception, or is it a, uh, a deliberate misperception that your views are not out there in uh, mainstream uh, media? Well, there may be some people who um, try to um, you know, promote the misperception, uh, but uh, there are certainly um, uh, people around in the world who just have the wrong impression and they have not been informed. And the purpose of our letter, um, one major purpose, was to make it clear that... Um, lots and lots of evangelicals, not just hundreds of thousands, but millions and millions of evangelicals, uh, don't think that way. We want, we're not in any way anti-Israel, we're not anti-Palestinian, uh, we want justice and peace and freedom and a secure state for both people, and both peoples, and uh, we wanted to say that clearly and uh, make it known, and um, the attention that it's got uh, certainly demonstrates that uh, apparently there are people who didn't know that. Okay. Now, the 33 other leaders, and uh, there are some impressive names on this list, uh, th how many people do you think, uh, or leaders including you, yourself, how many people do you think you represent out there in the United States? You know, there's no solid uh, polling data to permit me to give you a precise answer to that. I mean, you know, give or take 10 million. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree with um, the uh, person who was quoted uh, in the Times story 
Mr. Weber, who says that um, uh, dispensationalists, the kind of people who think the way Mr. Hagee does, uh, are a minority uh, in the evangelical world. That uh, the kind of viewpoint um, our letter represents uh, represents a majority of evangelicals. Uh, but there's no question that, but that um, there are significant numbers of people who agree with Mr. Hagee. But how many, uh, I was talking about the people that agree with you uh, and these 34 well, and these 33 other leaders. If it's a majority of evangelicals, then we're talking about uh, 35 million, 45 million uh, people. So are we talking about 35 million people in the United States that see it your way? Um, if it's a majority of evangelicals, then anywhere from 35 to 50 million people see it. Most okay. So why John Hagee with his, um, with his extremist views is the star of the day then? Uh, I find that strange myself. Um, and uh, it uh, is certainly time for that uh, uh, view to be corrected that uh, suggests that he speaks for the majority. He doesn't. Okay. So is he popular with APAC because of his views on... No, I'll have to let um, APAC uh, tell you uh, why uh, uh, he's popular with them. Uh, that's their judgment call, uh, okay. not mine, but uh, it's important that uh, they and everybody else understand that uh, he represents a minority view in the evangelical world okay. and uh, not a majority view. D don't you find it odd that... I'm going to go back to uh, the APAC and uh, Hagee relationship here. Don't you find it odd that someone who's calling for the destruction of the state of Israel and the destruction of the Jewish people ultimately would be a favorite with APAC and the Jewish community? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I was actually talking with uh, a, um, a Jewish reporter uh, uh, earlier today and he asked a, a rather different kind of question of um, uh, an organization that was working closely with uh, people like Mr. Hagee, and he said, uh, now isn't it true that uh, the people who sent the letter to Bush, President Bush, uh, say that they want a two-state solution, and isn't it true that that's the official policy, both of the U.S. government and of the government of Israel? Uh, and if that's true, then isn't it true that... Um, uh, these people agree with um, uh, the U.S. policy and with the policy of the State of Israel, and Mr. Hagee and his folks uh, disagree because they don't want any land to be given up. And so why wouldn't you uh, uh, make your connections with people who, who agree with um, American and Israeli policy rather than those who disagree with it? I think that's an interesting question, too. Right. And you think that's the way it should be? Well, you know, I'm not going to tell other people uh, who uh, they're supposed to associate with. Uh, that's, that's their choice. But uh, it certainly is the case that the people who signed um, our letter and who favor a two-state solution are much closer to uh, the stated policy of both Israel and the uh, United States um, than uh, Mr. Hagee, who um, opposes any two-state solution. Now... On Capitol Hill, and you're saying that most, or if not all, U.S. policy makers, they have the same misperception. Uh, uh, do you think they really have that misperception, or are they being fed more by John Hagee Group than you guys? You know, I've never done any poll to know uh, what uh, the um, uh, U.S. House and Senate uh, think about the evangelical world on this issue, so I don't have hard data on that. Uh, I'm sure that some people understand the variations more than others, but uh, what we're trying to do is to help everybody understand uh, that, in fact, um, a large number of evangelicals uh, want a two-state solution that's fair to everybody. And we hope that work gets out to Congress. We hope it gets through to the President loud and clearly. We hope it gets out to um, um, everybody else, including the Muslim world. Okay. Now, let's, let's get into um, the uh, process of the two-state solutions. I just got back from a trip uh, from uh, the West Bank. I visited the West Bank last week. 
And what I saw there, it would make it impossible, even if Israel uh, accepts the two-state solutions, and even if the United States uses its influence on uh, the state of Israel and the uh, uh, APAC and, uh, and such, uh, it is impossible to have a two-state solution with the settlements the way they are in the West Bank and with the wall that is snaking through the West Bank and surrounding all uh, Palestinian cities. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I, at this point, am a, a spokesperson for the people who signed the letter, and our letter doesn't go into that kind of detail. Right. Uh, is so there a reason why it did not go into those type of details, since the two-state solution is almost impossible, and you're asking for a two-state solution? Well, I mean, our, our letter uh, does um, say that um, we want a... A viable, I think that's the word we use. And looking right. At that quote, and we want a viable uh, state um, for the Palestinians. Uh, we're religious leaders in the United States. We don't think it's our task to try to work out the details of what a political compromise will need to be. We do say in our letter that if there's going to be a solution, there's got to be a compromise both ways. Uh, the um, uh, the uh, Oslo Agreement and other kinds of uh, you know, positions have clearly indicated that um, most of the West Bank uh, needs to be part of a Palestinian state if it's to be viable. Okay. And I think that probably no. everybody who signed the letter would would agree with that. But we we didn't in the letter um, you know go into the careful details of everything that's got to be hashed out for an agreement to emerge. What we're clear on is there's got to be compromise. Uh, and we think that unless the American president pushes both sides hard, that probably won't happen. Now, uh, let's go back to your letter and, you, uh, and you're saying a viable state. A viable state will not take place unless the settlements are gone and the wall is destroyed and turned down. Um, that's basically what you are saying, correct? And obviously, um, many of the settlements um, have to come down. I, I think just in terms of practical politics, uh, it's almost certain that not all of them will. Um, and that'll have to be the compromise that the Israelis and Palestinians work out together. We're not trying to do that detailed uh, political uh, negotiating for them. We just say we think that's crucial uh, that it happens. We think the compromise is necessary, and we think the American president and, and the administration needs to push both sides hard to try to make that happen. Okay. Now, when you say in your letter that a Palestinian state should be on the vast, and the, the exact words that you use, the vast majority of the West Bank, what do you mean by the vast majority? What sections of the West Bank that you uh, did not include? I think uh, I've already told you that uh, this letter doesn't try to <laughs> give you the details. I think the words uh, vast majority are, are pretty clear English and speak for themselves, uh, but uh, we didn't try to draw a map. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, when you say vast majority, you know, 90% is vast majority. Do you have an, a particular percentage in mind? We didn't, um, we didn't uh, put a figure in the letter, and I wouldn't presume to... Uh, say exactly what the letter is, but uh, the vast majority is pretty clear English. Okay. Now, what about biblical problems here when you're asking Israel to give up land that biblically, supposedly, was theirs, as John Haggis and other... Uh, so how, how do you stand biblically on that, by asking Israel to give up this land? Well... We certainly don't think um, that, um, I mean, there, there are some biblical statements that talk about um, all the land from the Mediterranean to the two rivers, uh, to the Euphrates, uh, uh, being, um, uh, you know, promised. And uh, we certainly don't think that uh, that's um, a promise that's now relevant in any way uh, for the present state of Israel. Um, we think that um, uh, the present state of Israel is a secular 
state uh, and uh, God wants justice for it God wants justice for every other state uh, uh, in the world and uh, all peoples of the world and uh, we're going to work hard to try to insist on justice uh, for the Israelis um, and justice for the Palestinians uh, um, peace for both peoples so you don't see the secular state of Israel as the fulfillment of biblical prophecy the people who signed uh, my letter uh, would not um, um, certainly uh, in, in general um, say that that's um, an idea that they endorse um, the, the, I don't know there may be somebody who thinks in some of those, some of those terms but um, um, I don't and I don't think um, very many of the people who signed it would if that's the case then when you in your letter when you use the uh, um, the, the biblical uh, promise to Abraham I will bless those who bless you and uh, are we and then you, you, you're talking about the Jews and the present state of Israel does that uh, uh, they're not included in that promise are they? Well I suppose um, that the promise was to Abraham and that includes um, his children uh, and that includes uh, the children of uh, um, of Isaac uh, and uh, also um, um, of uh, Hagar and her son uh, Ishmael but what we want to say is that the way that God blesses people is by calling them to in fact do justice if anything's clear from the Hebrew scriptures it is that uh, precisely the Hebrew prophets made it clear that God demands justice from his people and we want to say that uh, that surely means that um, um, the current state of Israel which um, is certainly understands itself uh, as a Jewish state um, should um, in fact uh, be doing justice we also want to say the same thing for the Palestinians that, that um, uh, they're, if they're Muslims their own teachings uh, call them to do justice if they're Christian Palestinians, um, then their uh, their biblical teachings um, uh, call them to do justice, and uh, that means very clear things about how they treat the Israelis. Okay. Um, now, if if we agreed that the uh, present state of Israel, which makes the Israelis uh, uh, not a biblical prophecy that was uh, accomplished. Um, you go into saying historical honesty compels us to recognize that both Israelis and Palestinians have legitimate rights stretching back for millennia. Can you explain that and allude to the fact that we accomplished already that the state of Israel is not a biblical prophecy being accomplished? Well, the state of Israel is, is clearly a state uh, with uh, a Jewish identity. Um, and um, it's perfectly clear historically that um, um, the people of Israel um, uh, lived in that land uh, for um, a thousand plus years uh, before the time of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jews um, have lived in that land uh, um, ever since, to some extent. Uh, there were certainly times when, when both Christians and Muslims uh, mistreated them terribly and uh, drove many of them out uh, but um, there have been you know, Jews um, in that land for over 3,000 years um, so you know, they obviously had uh, some uh, history there uh, people um, um, who are now called Palestinians uh, have lived in that land there have been Christian Palestinians who have lived there probably since the time of Jesus uh, that's 2,000 years uh, and um, many many Palestinians can trace their ancestry back for a very long time and even when they can't trace it back the, uh, the likelihood is that they've been there for, um, for millennia so both people it seems to me have very good reasons for saying that they have a legitimate right um, to be a people in this land and I think uh, that that means they ought to have a, a viable, safe, secure state. 
Okay. Um, what do you think? Are we? I mean, do you see that we might, um, especially that President Bush is calling for a conference in uh, in the fall to uh, hopefully take care of this problem? Do Do you foresee anything happening uh, in the next year? Well, I certainly wouldn't talk about uh, the conference this fall taking care of the problem. I devoutly wish and pray that uh, it could move us ahead significantly. Uh, the problems have been so intractable that uh, at times it makes one almost despair of uh, any real movement, and uh, things haven't gotten easier in the last uh, two months or the last uh, year and a half. So I don't presume to know uh, what will uh, emerge uh, this fall and in the next um, uh, basically year and a half of President Bush's term, what we're saying to him is, uh, we, we, we beg you, we pray that you will indeed work vigorously, uh, more vigorously than you have, to uh, try hard to get um, the Palestinians and the Israelis to a fair, just uh, agreement uh, that, in fact, could bring an end to the terrible agony, uh, the terrible... Uh, uh, ongoing violence uh, that's happening uh, in that um, holy land. So we'll uh, we'll pray, uh, we'll hope, uh, we'll do our best in terms of urging. Uh, but uh, I certainly wouldn't uh, be foolish enough to make a prediction as to what in fact is going to happen in the next uh, three months or or uh, eighteen months. Okay. Um, now, regardless of how really historically look at Israel and who these people are in Israel, the facts on the ground today are these people are so intermingled that, and there's no way that one of them is going to uh, finish off the uh, the other. So a solution to the problem uh, is a must. Now, if uh, you're asking President uh, Bush to uh, give you an audience, and if he does, if he says, okay, guys, come on over and uh, let's talk about this, and if he says, tell me, what do you think the Palestinians should do, and because you're talking about compromises, and what do you think the Israelis should do? So if he asked you that question, what would you answer him? I don't have any expectation that the President will ask us to give him uh, the detailed uh, uh, let's assume he let's, let's assume assume he did. So, what would your answer be? Um, if um, if he asked us uh, to give him that, uh, we would certainly um, come back to uh, our experts that work on these things, and uh, we would do uh, careful analysis, and uh, we would make some concrete proposals. But uh, so do you have any idea what Israel has to do and what the Palestinians have to do, like immediate steps? Well, I mean, the basic picture is quite clear, um, uh, and uh, that is that uh, that uh, Israel needs to pull out um, uh, most of the scattered settlements uh, and uh, decide that uh, it will really work uh, vigorously and uh, and, uh, and enthusiastically uh, with Palestinians. The Palestinians have to end the violence. Uh, against Israel and uh, decide that they will, in fact, uh, embrace a, uh, a, a viable um, uh, state as part of a two-state solution. That basic framework is clear. Uh, there are enormously complicated, uh, detailed issues, which you know and I know, that um, they'll have to work out um, together. Now, let me ask you this. What, what is stopping Israel from just saying, okay, you can have the West Bank, we're out? You know, I um, I don't presume to uh, be able to ask uh, answer all the questions that you might want to ask the um, the, pre the um, prime minister of Israel. Okay, but I mean, I, I don't understand why Israel is holding on the West Bank when it's costing them a lot of money to administer. It's costing them a lot of agony. It's costing them a lot of, you know, when it comes to money, reputation, and just problems. Why? If they have the intention of ever leaving, um, well, let me ask you this directly. Do you think Israel has the intention of ever leaving the West Bank? That, uh, that clearly is the, the policy of the, of the current prime minister. 
that's what he said uh, he wants to do. So um, I um, uh, trust that that's an honest statement. Um, just as um, I trust that uh, Mr. Abbas uh, uh, means it when he says he wants to work out a peace agreement with the Israelis. Do you expect... Hamas is a different matter. Hamas is very clear. They don't uh, um, want Israel to exist and they want to uh, get rid of them. Do you expect President Bush to invite you guys over to the White House? Um, I don't know that it's uh, um, helpful to speculate on uh, how that will go. We asked for a, a conversation and uh, we'll uh, certainly take it up if we are invited. Okay. Normally, John Hagee Group will have hundreds of thousands of people uh, send in faxes and call in the White House uh, and uh, congressional offices, etc., etc. Do, do you guys have that kind of ability and the uh, uh, systems on the ground, uh, logistics on the ground to actually handle that? I think hundreds of thousands is probably overstated, but uh, the, uh, I believe um, his organization, according to the Times, is 55 thousand people on uh, an email um, system that gets a weekly um, email update. Um, you know, there isn't one organization uh, among the signers that's working exclusively on this issue the way he has an organization focused on that. Uh, you know, we're presidents, um, you know, a couple of people are are heads of evangelical denominations or heads of evangelical um, colleges and seminary presidents and the editor of Christianity Today, the largest evangelical, the most uh, you know, influential evangelical magazine in the country, uh, on and on. And you know, we have many, many responsibilities. We're not um, um, primarily um, political people. We're certainly not focused on just one issue. So um, you know, we work at it in different ways, but um, uh, I believe the editor of um, a magazine that has um, 150,000 or so circulation is doing um, um, a piece uh, that deals with this um, uh, in a positive way, so that sort of thing happens. You know, what, uh, what John Hagee is doing, it, it doesn't really make any sense, because you know, Israel already has uh, nuclear bombs. Israel is already a strong military uh, state. And if John Hagee wants Armageddon, he should be pushing for the other guys to have nukes so he can get his Armageddon. So he should be helping Iran and Syria and the other Arab countries getting these nuclear bombs to have his Armageddon. D don't you think that would make more sense than what he's doing? <laughs> You'll have to ask him that. Yeah, I mean, if, if he wants to have uh, Armageddon, that's what he uh, should do. Um, well, uh, it has been uh, uh, extremely important. I'm, I'm glad we got you on because, you know, I was under the assumption, I was one of those people with the misperception that in, uh, uh, evangelicals are basically uh, blindly uh, after Israel and after having uh, Armageddon and killing all the Jews so they can rapture and uh, go sit uh, on the right hand side of God but apparently not all evangelicals believe in that no, no, certainly not um, there's, um, there's millions and millions and millions of what uh, I call evangelical centrists who uh, um, are deeply committed to Jesus Christ and uh, they're Orthodox Christians, Bible-believing Christians, uh, but um, they don't have that kind of particular uh, dispensational uh, theology about the end of the world. We believe that Christ will return sometime. We don't know when. Uh, in fact, Jesus himself said he didn't know when. Uh, and and uh, so I say, um, beware of people who claim to know more than Jesus did about uh, just when he's coming back. And if it's, if it's tomorrow, that's fine with me. Uh, if it's in a thousand years, uh, that's fine with me. But meanwhile, I'm supposed to go on living the way he told me to live, and that includes um, caring about the poor and doing justice uh, and caring for creation and um, inviting other people to hear about Jesus Christ. And uh, that's what uh, the kind of centrist evangelical uh, that I represent um, is, is talking about. Uh, it's a kind of it's a more recent development. Uh, a lot of evangelicals were perceived as right wing. They're still um, you know, a number that are, but in fact, uh, 
there's a, a big evangelical center emerging that uh, cares about the poor and the family, cares about the sanctity of human life and peacemaking and creation care, and in this case, uh, also justice for Palestinians and Israelis. Very good, sir. Um, I want to thank you for coming on. It has been a pleasure having you. Delighted to be with you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Ronald Sider, uh, he is the uh, president of uh, the uh, Evangelical Action Network, I believe the name of the uh, organization. And um, it is the Evangelicals for Social Action, Dr. R Ronald Sider. Uh, it is extremely um, important that uh, we felt we should bring you this evangelical whom with other evangelical leaders from around the country has sent this letter to President Bush telling him that look we're not all lunatics like John Hagee Grube we're not all lunatics like Pat Robertson and Jerry Falwell who I might add is resting in hell I don't know that but uh, he should be there and um, uh, but we are uh, talking about 34 leaders of uh, evangelicals you know one of them has uh, he's like a president of uh, like 2,000 churches under uh, his uh, leadership so uh, I, I believe when uh, Dr. Sider, and of course we welcome your uh, phone calls, um, the uh, number is right there on the, uh, on the screen, that uh, it is so important. But I really believe these guys, even though they outnumber the people that John Hagee speaks for, but John Hagee, what John Hagee does is good for APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. That's why he's the star of the show there. And I always said on this show, it doesn't make sense. John Hagee, what John Hagee wants is basically to have the Jews convert to Christianity, which it will not happen. He thinks that 144,000 will convert and the rest will die. He wants to have Armageddon. Now, I do believe that this world is going to end one day. And uh, Muslims, by the way, are waiting for the return of Christ uh, at the end of time. So uh, Muslims and Christians, they, they do agree that at the end of time, Jesus, not Muhammad, Jesus will come down and uh, it will be the end of time. But if we take that theory... Uh, a, a billion Muslims and a billion uh, Christians, that's two billion. We have six billion in, uh, in the world. So that's only one-third of people in this world that believe in that. And that's Muslims and Christians. But uh, I don't really believe that um, a viable Palestinian state, which, you know, th th these people got to be very careful, even though they don't want to... Uh, to say what they believe, but you're not going to have a viable Palestinian state unless Israel removes these settlements that they are building. And we have pictures to show you these settlements uh, on uh, that Israel is uh, uh, building, like uh, picture 19, for instance, go to frame 19. Uh, you know, almost, I just got back from Palestine, as most of you know, and uh, on top of every uh, this is a uh, like a, uh, a settlement that's uh, a um, uh, like on top of the mountains. Almost on every mountain top, there is an Israeli settlement in the West Bank. So when when they say a viable, I, I really don't think that at this point, unless Israel stops building the settlements, unless Israel removes these settlements, you're not going to have a viable Palestinian state. Because on top of every hill over there in Palestine, you're going to find an Israeli settlement. And uh, also, you know, the, uh, the, the wall that is going on. You know, right now you see uh, this picture, you know, it shows you uh, settlements up on top, and then you have uh, the wall that uh, the Israelis are building. And uh, if you go to uh, some of these pictures that we have um, uh, with the, um, uh, like from 5 to 10, 
you will see uh, they still continue in building the wall. You know, they, they talk o- uh, about peace, but they're still building the wall. They did not stop building the wall. And y- y- you might think it's like, you know, there's no way. And, and from what I've seen there, there's no way that we are going to have peace or two-state solutions as long as Israel is uh, continuing doing this. And um, what bothers me, um, you know, uh, don't get me wrong, you know, with these evangelicals coming out and putting this out the way they did, and these people have been talking uh, like that for uh, uh, for a while, but they're not, they're not given their day in the media. Their opinion is not something that the media is interested in, but they are interested in the opinion of John Hagee, who basically makes himself, and the media made him, as the one who speaks for evangelicals. And he is not. He does not speak for the majority, not actually a small minority of evangelicals who believe in John Hagee's theology of dispensationalism. Most evangelicals don't believe in that. And most evangelicals don't believe that we have to kill all the Jews in order for Jesus to come back and be the end of day and have uh, be a uh, judgment day. And, you know, peace is not something new between the Israelis and uh, the Arabs. As you remember, way back in 1977, when uh, Sadat went to uh, Israel, and uh, we all remember uh, Carter... Begin and Sadat, which is uh, picture 21 if we go to that one, uh, you will see that um, there was, it could be peace between the Arabs and the Israelis. And President Clinton came very close at accomplishing peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis as you see here with Yasser Arafat and Ishaq Rabin when they signed off on the Oslo agreement that did not work but at least they sat down and agreed that let's try to live with each other since we can't kill each other and finish each other off completely let's try to live with each other and it can happen because right after the Oslo peace agreement if Israel would have kept its promise from 1993 to 1995 there was supposed to be a five year span where issues such as Jerusalem refugees water borders trade, etc., etc., Jerusalem. These issues were supposed to have been ironed out within this five-year period, and a Palestinian state was supposed to have been established in 1988. That was what the Oslo Agreement that President Arafat and President Rabin have signed, which both of them, by the way, were assassinated. Rabin was assassinated so he will not finish this peace term that he went on with the uh, Palestinians because forces out there did not want Israel to have peace. Forces such as John Hagee group who want to sacrifice the whole Middle East so they can rapture. Isn't that selfish? Isn't that selfish? That you want to destroy these people, you want to kill these people. So as John Hagee puts it, so he can, so Jesus can come down. Now how many times, and Dr. Sider had said it, how many times did we have events throughout history 
that could have been similar to what is happening now where people might have said at that time that Jesus will come in our time, in our lifetime and Jesus did not so how do we know that Jesus is coming in John Hagee's life which by the way he's I think in his 70s so Jesus better come down fast if John Hagee wants, if he wants to catch John Hagee um, alive uh, something interesting though ladies and gentlemen took place in my conversation with uh, Dr. Sider he did agree that Israel is a secular state and if we look at Israel and the composition of the population of Israel which is it's a little too late because it really does not matter at this stage of the game in the game but just to show that Israel has nothing to do with biblical prophecies the state of Israel today has nothing to do with biblical prophecies because as he said this is a secular state that was established due to the efforts of the Zionist organizations Jewish money, he didn't say that, I'm saying that Jewish money and uh, influence on the media and government at that time because if the Arabs had more influence on the British government and other governments such as the United States and the Soviet Union at that time then we would not see, we would not have the state of Israel today but because the Jewish people throughout the world mainly in Britain they secured the promise of the British government for the establishment of a Jewish state and by the way most of these people with the Zionist organizations they were not religious people and they will tell you that it means not that they are uh, ashamed of it and when we say that God that he will bless those who blesses you talking about Israel definitely definitely Israel the Israel that God was talking about is not the Israel of today so there's nothing there is no biblical prophecies that have been accomplished by the establishment of the state of Israel so John Hagee's theology is completely wrong because that is not what is in, 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 in Palestine right now is not the return of the seed of Abraham because the seed of Abraham never left that includes Jews, Muslims and Christians but the majority of Jews in Palestine at this time they are of European descent but it really doesn't matter talking about this now because it does not really mean anything fact on the ground you have people who have been living there and I'm talking about the Jewish people or those who claim to be Jews and known today as Israelis they have been living there for a long time and I think that's a fact of life that the Palestinians have a, came a long time ago agreed to recognize those people and recognize their right to live on the land of Palestine it's not that the Palestinians are rejecting the Israelis that's a fact of life that the Palestinians have to deal with it and they accepted it but the question is those who came from abroad and took the land from the Palestinians that's where the problem is and they want the whole peace which is by the way what's left for the Palestinian now is probably less than 10% and if anything is going to happen with this conference in the fall will probably remain at this 10 percent but remember the West Bank is 22 percent of Palestine but now the Palestinian Authority wants something and wants something quick so they will probably agree 
to what's going to come in the fall. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you Thursday, 6.30 on Thursday. Good night. Those, those folks that were responsible and that they're taking this very seriously. You know, this sounds very similar to PR advice that people get in the United States when there's a crisis. Acknowledge there's a problem, say you knew about it all along and that you've been working on it and uh, hopefully it's, it's already being corrected. Um, I would say they're very similar principles. Do you hope that by improving the way that Chinese officials talk to the world, you might actually help to create a more open China? I, I believe that a more engaged and open China will definitely make...